Welcome to FCF Tucson, and thank you for visiting our broadcasts. Before we get into this message, we want to let you know that if you have any need for prayer or victories you'd like to share, you can let us know through the links in the video description below. And if you've been blessed by these teachings and would like to help us to reach others, you can securely give by visiting our website or clicking on the link again in the video description below. And lastly, please consider helping us to get this message out by sharing it or sharing our page with your friends and family. It is such an honor for us when you do. Thank you. And now, today's message. Because it's together that we defy the odds. Together we defy the odds. You know that word that kind of, that the place, that encouragement, the exhortation that, that uh, came forth earlier, that place of maybe sometimes we feel overwhelmed in things in life. And we all do. We all feel overwhelmed. overwhelmed. Sometimes we feel alone. Sometimes we feel like, man, we've just, that to everybody and everything is against us. Now, usually if we stop long enough to think about it and kind of pray, we know that that's not entirely true that not everybody is absolutely out to get you, but sometimes it feels that way, doesn't it? Sometimes it feels like every circumstance in life is just working against you, and it just feels like we're just, you know, like COPD of life. It's just the weight and the pressure is just, we can't get a, a, a breath of air. We feel overwhelmed. I hope that you're not trying to attack those things, tackle those things, maneuver those things by yourself. Because you weren't intended to. God never intended us to try to deal with life alone. We need good friends. We need people that will come alongside. We need family. There's this thing called synergy. And the law of synergy states that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Basically, meaning that place of when we combine our knowledge and skills and our efforts with other like-minded people, that those those efforts aren't doubled, but they're they're exponentially increased. It's not 2 plus 2 equals 4, but 2 plus 2 equals 8. 2 plus 2 equals 10. Because synergy is a place where energy is multiplied through cooperation. Where energy, the things that we're doing, are multiplied by cooperating, working with, connecting with other people. And there's a few places that we see this law really in action. One of those is is in music. Maybe you don't listen to barbershop quartets, but the barbershop quartet is a great place to, see, to hear synergy. Because here's what they do. There's this technique called ringing a chord. And the barbershop quartet, so you've got the four different parts. You know, you've got your bass and all the tenors and, the, you know, and those things. And, and so they're, they're, they're singing together. And usually it's at the tag, the end of a song. It's going to be like a, a whole note, a, 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 a major chord or sometimes a seventh. But, uh, um, and they're going to hit that note. And they all come together and they swell and they hit that note and they hold that note together in each one of their specific um, octaves, keys, parts, right? And when they hold that note and it all comes together, it's like that place of all of a sudden you begin to hear almost a choral experience. And they call this thing a ghost note or a ghost voice. Because in the midst of that and those frequencies bouncing off one another, bouncing off the walls and and hitting each other, it it creates another frequency in the mix that you can hear. It's almost like you can almost begin to hear what the soprano part would be even though none of these guys are a soprano. Now, I wish, hats and all, (laughs) we we had a barbershop quartet with us here today that could get up and just demonstrate this for us. And I'm not sure how this is going to ring or resonate in the room, but we've got a little clip of this quartet coming together on a note that we're going to try to listen to and see if we can hear that effect, that place of synergy where there's an additional person in the mix that's not really there. Let's just try to play this and see if we can find it together. When I leave the world behind 
And again, you're on a, on a recording and, and, and some of those things. But that, that, that is that place of what they talk about when, when they start using as an example of ringing a chord or a voice note. That uh, in those, maybe you watch, uh, um, oh, I can't even, The Voice. Or maybe you watch, what was the acapella? The, that, what a cool show. Man, I love that. Just all those voices coming together and you're hearing the trumpets and the saxophones and it's just people, just people singing. But in this place of that barbershop quartet, there's a place of uh, when they, they can come together, that they, 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 there's that note, that voice, vo- uh, uh, ghost chord in the mix. That's a place of synergy. Another thing that we see that in might be in, uh, um, with people and working together. You know, there's the, the Belgium... Um, Draft horse is one of the strongest horses in the entire world. And this horse, by itself, they, can, they do these competitions. This horse can pull about 8,000 pounds by itself. Now, the thing is, is though, if they'll take two of these draft horses that are total strangers together, they grew up on different farms, you know, they don't know each other, they're just meeting for the first time and falling in low. And they meet for the first time, and they're hitched up together in this wagon, and they're hitched up with this load to pull. That you would think that hey, they, they can pull. One can pull eight thousand together. They can pull sixteen. Well, they found out that actually, when these two horses can do that, they pull somewhere between twenty to twenty-four thousand pounds, three times the capacity of just one by itself. That synergy. Two stranger horses. They found this other thing interesting. That now, if they took two horses, these same horses, that grew up together, they played ball in the backyard. <laughs> they knew one another. They were trained together. And they put these two horses, buddy horses, friends, together, side by side to pull. That they would pull between thirty to 34,000 pounds. Four times the capacity of one. Why? Because there was not just a place of synergy and working and pulling together, but there was a place of knowing one another. You know when you just get linked and you get in sync with somebody and you're just in step with them and you just know what they're going to do before they do it? Come on, that's, that, 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 that's what we're talking about. These horses that work and pull together, they know that maybe that one uh, 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 just leans a little extra to the right and so you automatically compensate automatically compensate for the weakness or the deficiency or the tendencies of other people that you're partnered with and together it was exponential to increase you know in ecclesiastes chapter 4 ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 12 there's this verse and it says that hey one person against the enemy may fall it says, two can withstand him. And a threefold cord is not easily broken. Well, I went to a manufacturer's website of rope, and I don't remember now if it was um, nylon, polyester, some sort of weird synthetic, or just good old fiber rope, but they, were, they had all the specs for the rope on there. And they, they using this, uh, um, the same strands, the same size strands, they said this, that if they took a cor- made, put those strands together and made a quarter-inch rope, that that quarter-inch rope had 1,100 pounds of safe load that it, could, that it would hold. Now, they use those same size threads, and they still do this, and they make a half-inch rope, that that half-inch rope had a 4,280-pound 4, safe load limit, four times. We, we doubled the size of the rope four times the strength. Then they took that same rope and they did it as a three-quarter inch rope. And a three-quarter inch rope, it had 9,520 pounds. Almost 10, 10 times what the quarter inch rope was. We took it to an inch and a, an a inch, those same fibers, the same strength, the same individual fibers coming together four times the quarter inch. Four, you know, right? A quarter times four is a whole one, four over four. I'm just helping. There's some, we're getting ready to go back to school, and some of you parents are going to have to remember this stuff because your kids are going to be asking you. And, you know, I'm just trying to prime the pump a little bit. So four over four, a hole, that one-inch deal, that it was 
16,000. 16 times the original strength of the quarter-inch rope at a one-inch rope. Guess what happened when we took it to two inches? 64,000 pounds. The eight inches, or eight, eight times that original fibers for that rope, and yet we had 64 times the strength. That's the law of synergy. That's that place of those things coming and working together. See, synergy leads to multiplication. We are stronger together. That no matter what you're up against, no matter what we face, no matter what needs pulled, and no matter what may try to break you, no matter what tries to break us, we are stronger together. In Acts chapter 6, there's a, a, another biblical uh, example. We saw a verse in Ecclesiastes. We see a biblical example in Acts chapter 6, and that is here in the early church. So in the early church, they'd come together, and they're working, and, and, and they're doing everything they can to reach their community there in Jerusalem. And uh, 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 in the midst of this, they found that there was work that wasn't being accomplished well. It wasn't being done. There were people that were getting left out in the daily distribution of foods, and they said, we need a solution to this. We need a, 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 an answer to this. And, and they came up with one, and they added seven people to their team. Just seven. Listen, just seven. At this point, there's, only, there's the 12 of them. There's the, the 11 apostles plus then the new apostle that they added in, right, in Acts chapter 1. Uh, uh, uh. And then now we've got, so these 12 plus seven and it says that when they did that, Acts chapter 6, verse 7, that the word spread and the disciples were greatly multiplied. See, synergy leads not just to, to increase strength, but it leads to multiplication. Multiplication of impact. Multiplication of of. of of, of the product, of what we produce, multiplication. If working together leads to enhanced strength and multiplication of efforts, then coming together, working together, standing together, being together, we can indeed defy the odds. No matter what's stacked up against you, no matter what Vegas would put are the odds about you going down, <laughs> We can defeat those odds and come out on top together. Let's go to Judges chapter 7. I'm going to look at a, an example of this and talk about some of these things today. You know, first of all, as we go there, it's okay to feel overwhelmed. Sometimes I think in, in churches, in churchdom, we almost... Put people down for having a bad day. Well, you're in Christ. You should be happy all the time. Enjoy all. It doesn't mean that problems don't come. You know, the Bible says in Mark chapter 14, we're still going to Judges 7. In Mark chapter 14, the Bible says this. It says that Jesus, Jesus, God, come on, in the flesh, the Son of God. It says that he was so overwhelmed with grief, and with sadness. It says, he was overwhelmed with grief and sadness to the point of death. Mark 14, 34. To the point of death. I mean, the guy's thinking about how, like, man, I've been busting my hump for the last three and a half years, and everything that I do, I'm confronted by the enemy at every turn. He's trying to stop me at everything. The enemy is absolutely working against me. He's like, I'm about, I know I'm about to be betrayed. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. He just, he just said, hey, goodbye to Judas, who's about to betray him. He says, I know I'm about to get stabbed in the back. I already feel the cut. I already feel the wound. He knows that his disciples are, are, are going to, to abandon him in here in just a few minutes. And he knows that the Father God is going to speak the curses of, of his broken law over him. He knows all these things are about to happen. He's so overwhelmed in that moment to the point of death. 
He knows what it's like to feel that way. We don't serve a God that doesn't know what, it's, what it feels like to just have a day where you go, oh my gosh, why did I get out of bed? But he's also a God that understands echad. He understands unity. Amen? Here in, in Judges chapter 7, we've got Gideon. And you might remember from our Unlikely Heroes series earlier this year that we looked a little bit at, at, at Gideon's journey from a zero to a hero. That place of, of then overcoming his own personal inferiority to become the man of God, the person of God that God called him to be. And he's still in this process as we find him in Judges chapter 7. At this point, he's had some pretty good success. He's been overcoming some things. And there's at least 32,000 men that say, wow, we didn't know who Gideon was a few, uh, a few weeks ago, but we will go into battle with this man. We're willing to go with him. And Miss Dorothy, do you, need, can I, do you need somebody to come help you? Okay, thank you, Elaine. Praise be to God. And so, he's been going through this process. We know the Amalekites, the Midianites, they've been oppressed for seven years, been beat up, been bullied, been all their crops and destroyed and these things. And this is the process. This is the climate of what's going on. And the Midianites, the Amalekites, they come together and they say, man, we're going to go back through and we're going to, to wreak havoc uh, um, uh, 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 yet again, we've been hearing about some people swelling, that this, this hero kind of rising up, and we need to put a kibosh on this. We need to stop this thing quickly. So they sent 135,000 troops, 135,000 troops to, to, to go and, and reestablish and make sure that we just <clears throat> squash this rising. And there's 32,000. That's an odds of 4.22 to 1. Come on, four to one odds. Some people would like those odds. Four to one odds. And then what, God, what happens? God says, you know what? No, that's too many. That's too many. All those that would be afraid, all those that would have fear. If you've got fear in your heart, then I'll tell you what, you're still family. We still love you. You're still one of us. You're still part of us. But right now in this project, we can't have you serve with us right now. And at least 22,000 people went back home. Now you're standing there with 10,000 people. Two-thirds have left, gone home. Now you got these odds of, I think it's 13 and a half. Yeah, that would make sense. 10,000, 135,000. Yeah. 13 and a half. You get 14, I'll get 13. We'll come out, right? 13 and a half to one. And God says, hold on. This is still too many. Too many. And so ultimately then, the team comes back. It gets windled down to 300 men. Judges chapter 7. 300 men. That's the odds of 450 to 1. Overwhelming odds. And yet, God is about to do something absolutely miraculous. These 300 are about to defy all odds and win. Anytime, look, whatever's coming up against you, I don't care how big or how strong or how overwhelming that it may be, if you'll take time to get a divine strategy with God, if you'll partner with the people of God, that you can overcome. You can defeat the enemy. You can experience amazing victory, even at 450. I think that's interesting. In 1 Kings chapter 18, remember Elijah? In 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah went up against 450 
prophets of Baal. I'm not smart enough to know if there's something like, you know, super prophetic or connected to that thing. I just find that it's interesting that it worked out to 450 to 1. Same thing as within a light. I don't know. That's just, that's an aside. That was just something I think about. In this process, though, as we overcome, one thing that is for sure that we're going to have to do to defy the odds is we're going to have to address our fears. Not ignore our fears. Not pretend like the, the, the elephant in the room doesn't exist. But we need to address those fears. Sometimes for us individually, we might means we need to own our fears. And sometimes we need to be able to just say, you know what, right now, I'm freaked out about this. We need to have a safe environment with other people that we can say, this is what I'm facing, and I'm afraid, Jim. We need people that can, hopefully will come alongside and begin to encourage us and strengthen us and pray with us. Maybe in that battle, I just can't fight right now. I need someone to fight for me. I'm so overwhelmed, I need someone just to fight for me. And if we're going to have people we talked about last week to fight for us, we have to be willing to fight for others. We have to address our fears. We have to address them. I'm glad that in these things that God is never afraid of the odds. God's not afraid. God's not worried. God's not concerned. God is just fine. Do we ever find Judges chapter 7? I was going to read part of that first part there, but uh, let's jump down to verse. Uh, let's jump down to verse nine. We've got it down to the three hundred men now. Verse nine it says, "It happened in the same night that the Lord said to him, Arise and go down against the camp, for I have delivered it into your hand.' Stop. He has a very clear command from God. We know." That when God, that God is unliable, that's actually, I can't say that, hold on. Unliable doesn't mean what I just said. That he's a God who cannot lie. I did go to Indiana for my education. <laughs> I got a 790 on my SATs in math. I did not do so well on my verbal. So bear with me. Yeah, unliable does not mean one who doesn't lie, but... So this is, the, this is a God who cannot lie. It's not in his nature. He is truth, it says in Hebrews 13. The God that we know in his word, if he says it, we can believe it. We can take it to the bank. It's absolutely 100% true and reliable. Now he's the reliable God. And he just says, you can go do it, Alan. You got it. But then the rest of that verse, I love this. This is such the heart of God. But, verse 10, but if you're afraid to go down, go down to the camp with, with Purah, your servant, and you shall hear what they're saying, and afterward your hands shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. Then they snuck down, and they went down to the camp together. Here's what God just said. God just said, look, I'm not lying to you. I'm telling you the truth. You can do this. You've got this. This is my mission for you. This is the plan. I don't ask you to do something that I haven't empowered you to do. I'm not telling you to do something that I haven't gone before and prepared the way. I'm not going to put you in a situation for you to step out for then you to fail because that's not my character. That's not who I am. He says, but I know that this is really scary. And I know that you're really concerned. And I'm true, but I'm willing to help you in your faith just a little bit. I'm willing to help you in your faith a lot. I'm willing to work with you and help you to grow to that place that you'll never doubt, you'll never think a second thought ever again. He says, and I love the thing that he didn't, say, he didn't condemn Gideon. He didn't say, oh, you faithless dude, I know you don't believe me yet. 
Do you just need to go check this out? You'll see that I'm right. He says, if. What dignity did he bestow on Gideon? Go down tonight and take it, CD. If you're not sure, let me help you out. How many times do we face situations where we've seen the promise of God's word and we're still not sure? It's okay to say, God, I see your, the, 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 your word. I see the absolute promise in your word. And you know what, Lord? I believe you. <sighs> Help my unbelief. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And God will help us. Why? Because it's his goal that the mission be completed. It's his purpose. And he's going to work with his children to grow them and develop them and, and, and to, 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 to equip them to that place that they can walk in and have absolutely every promise and everything that he's given for us. Too many times we try to, to, to uh, um, we say things emboldening, I think, ourselves, trying to build ourselves up that hurt other people. Maybe, they're, maybe, maybe God says, you can go take the camp, and you just go, come on, let's strap, let's go, I'm ready. I'm ready to fight. And someone else says, yeah, I don't know about this. That was a really big IRS bill I got. And you're going, ah, it's no big thing. We're just going to trust God, believe God. We're going to ask him for more work. I just thank you, Lord, for a, you know, a bid coming in for this much and profit and praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And, uh, uh, and they're just going, yeah, I'm not quite there yet. Well, what are you doing? Why don't you, don't you believe God? Don't you trust God? And instead of encouraging, instead of building, we start putting people down and making them feel less than. That's not the heart of God. The heart of God is saying, oh, come on. You know what? I tell you what. I, I, maybe you're not quite there yet. Let me tell you a story. Let me give you a testimony or two. And God used the testimony of the enemy to build up the strength of his people. It says, they went down and they heard, uh, uh, verse 12, now the Midianites and the Malachites, all the people of the east were lying in the valley as numerous as locusts and their camels were without number. That is a lot of camels as the sand of the seashore and the multitude. And when Gideon had come, there was a man telling a dream to his companion. And he said, I have this, had this dream. To my surprise, a loaf of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian. It came to a tent and struck it so that it fell and overturned and the tent collapsed. Then his companion answered and said to him, this is nothing else but the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash. He says, oh man, you had a prophetic dream and we are going to lose. Well, Gideon overhears it and his faith is encouraged and he goes back up to his camp and now after not just hearing the word of God but hearing a testimony, man, th th we got this. He says, let's go guys, come on, 300 of us, let's do this. Don't you love those testimonies and those things that just kind of come that confirm those things that God's saying? That God told you something in your heart or you read it in his word and you're kind of moving that direction. You really feel and sense that the spirit of God is leading you in a particular direction and you're, 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 you're moving that direction, but maybe you're not at full sprint. And then all of a sudden you start, you hear these, these little uh, encouragements, you hear these confirmations and it's like, ooh, yeah, all right. And the pace increases, the strength increases. And then all of a sudden you find yourself, I got this. Ain't nothing getting in my way. Praise God, God's for me. Who can be against me? Here we go. We had some testimonies, some amazing things that this, this last week. You know, there was a, a gentleman in the neighborhood that just popped by. And uh, he goes to another local church, and he's come and visited us just a, a few times for special services and things. And, and, and uh, uh, um, real ni you know, nice man, a little bit different, you know, just vein of thought. But he loves God. We love God. And he just came in, and he was, we were talking about a situation in the, in the neighborhood he asked about. And uh, he just started saying, you know, I love you guys. And I love you because you guys absolutely live what you teach. He says, you believe your convictions. 
And he starts telling me about stuff that has been happening in the church. I was like, I haven't, when was the last time you even came to our church? You guys been on our website watching the services, you know, knows about the, the, you know, the Bible school classes here, knows about some of the works and the things that have been happening and, and, and uh, uh, the, all the different things. Our, he's just talking to me about these things like he's been here every day. And then, uh, uh, and then Miss Brenda, this last week, you know, she was getting her, she was getting her nails done. And she's just getting her nails done, and, and, the, and she's, she's just getting settled in. There's a lady that's there, and she's getting ready to leave. She's heading out. She finds out this lady is a co-owner of a restaurant in talking. And it just so happens that the lady is, the, is one of the, the co-owners at, at KG's. <laughs> yeah. If you don't know why, why that's, what, what the thing is, that last month, we just, is what we did, we just decided that if anybody was going to go out to eat at all in the month of August, that we were just going go to go to, to KG's. June, sorry, this is next month's August. Apparently, I don't understand the months of the year either. <laughs> yeah, it's hot. My brain's fried. I don't have any hair. I don't have any protection. Help me. So, so in the month of June, and, and we went, and we said, well, this is what we're going to do. Because it was about creating and maintaining fellowships. We went with people that we weren't, you know, that we didn't have the best of, of, of kinship and relationship and friendship with. And we had questions, and we were set and we talked and we grew relationships with one another at the same time. We just decided we're going to go there because it's summertime. A lot of kids and people are gone and we're going to financially impact this store during a summer month, right? And we left some really cool tips, right? We all left a bunch of $2 bills and things. And so Brenda mentions that. And she just says, yeah, have you guys seen a lot of any $2 bills or anything recently? And, and she's like, oh my gosh. And, and uh, they were talking about it. And she, she ended up saying, you know, thank you so much. Thank you guys so much for thinking of us and, you know, and partnering with it. Here's what we did. We took your guys' business card and we put them on our wall. We didn't go in and advertise. They advertised for us. People notice being unlikely heroes. In September, we're going to do that again. This time, we're going to probably divide between a couple different uh, 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 restaurants because that KG's got a pretty diverse menu. But we're going to be doing this again in September of that place of, of growing and strengthening our relationships with one another as the primary focus while blessing businesses here in the west side near our church. Amen? So we'll hear more about that. In next month. Um, but I love that place of that testimony that in just encouraged them and strengthened them. Then he tells them this back in Judges chapter 7. Judges chapter 7, verse 19. So Gideon and the hundred, uh, oh, not there yet. So then here's what Gideon does he tells them, he sends them out, he commissions them, verse 16. He divides the 300 men into three companies and he put a trumpet into every man's hand. This is not like a brass trumpet, you know, like I used to play in school. They didn't have those things. We're not even the Bronze Age really like happening real well. But we're talking about like shofars, the ram's horn. So everybody gets this ram's horn. Everybody gets a trumpet. And it says that everybody gets a, a torch and everybody gets a pitcher, basically a clay pot. I, I was in Mexico and I was like this last, you know, this last week in the thing and I was, just came in yesterday and I was thinking, I need to get to the store. I want to get some clay pots <laughs> just because I think this is really cool what they do next. And so armed, armed, going into battle with a flashlight and a kazoo. <laughs> wow. I mean, they've got a torch, a clay pitcher, and a ram's horn. And they're going into battle. Verse 20. Then the three companies blew the trumpets, and they broke, and they broke the pitchers. They, that's the part I wanted the clay pot for. I was like, I just want to smash something. It's like a clay pot and just go, psh. And the, the three pitchers... Uh, 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 they, they broke the pitchers, held the torches high in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands for blowing, and they cried, the sword of the Lord and for Gideon. And every man stood in his place all around the camp, and the whole army ran and cried out and fled. When the 300 blew the trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his own companion 
throughout the entire camp, and the army fled to Beth uh, uh, Acacia towards that place. As far as the, the border of, man, we need, to, we need to, anyway. Thank you, Gina. It's always nice to have someone that can actually like, pronounce Hebrew words and names near you. So, um, armed with a torch, a trumpet, and a clay pitcher. And at that command, these 300 men in this, the, the, that have, in these groups of 100 that have surrounded this valley, they all smashed those, those clay pots. And when they smashed the clay pot, their light was clear to be seen. Amen. That reminds me of a great verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, it says, For God who said, let there be light in darkness, has made his light shine in our hearts so we can know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. Listen to verse 7. We now have this light shining in our hearts. But we ourselves are like fragile clay, fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God and not from ourselves. That verse says, look, you're the clay pot. And when we got born again, when we came to Christ, there was a light that was ignited on the inside of us. And, you know, Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 5 in that place of the Sermon on the Mount about, you know, don't just cover your light. Don't put your light under the bed, but put it for everybody to be seen. And here's what these 300 guys did in that place of representation. They said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to burn bright the light that's in us so that people can see and know exactly who we are, that they're going to see the light of God, that the light would, would shine. We've got lights in us that need to shine. Some of us are just, it's like that, the, 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 the flower pots. We've got the little light shining out of the top of the, uh, out of the, top of the thing, and maybe some of us have cracked pots. <laughs> I didn't think about that one before I said it. <laughs> maybe some of us are cracked pots, and there's a little bit of light seeming and coming through, but here's what we need to do. We need to smash that clay pot and allow the light of God to come through. You know what happens? When we die to self, when we die to self, the light of Jesus is seen. When we put others first, the light of God is seen. When we boldly just stand and be the light, be the people of God that he's called us to be, Walking in the Spirit, being the people of the light. Proclaims his gospel, proclaims that place so that everyone can see. 300 people. What if we had 300 people bold enough to live the life of God, live the life of Jesus in them every day? What if we had 300 people that could, would come together and say, you know what, let's lock arms and let's pray. Let's lock arms and let's be about the kingdom. Let's lock arms and together let's do something. They had 450 times the impact in their city. See, it doesn't take a monstrous church to do something important for the community. All it takes is a handful of people willing to live their life for the gospel of Christ. Willing to come together for something bigger than the individual. The light. The light. Everywhere the enemy looked, they saw the light. I talked to other pastors and things here in Tucson, and I just think that's, a, that's what we all want. That's what we're praying. 
and we come together with a Pastor Gill at Sun Life and some of the other folks and we pray, we just start praying for the, 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 the people in our churches, respectively, to stand up and just be the light that in every neighborhood, in every workplace, from every congregation, from every place, that the people of the light would just be the light, just live like the light, so that everywhere that people turn, they see the light. Come on, we can do this, people. Then there was the trumpet, the ram's horn. And, and when this, the, the trumpet was blown, it was a call. It was a call, a place of gathering. The trumpet would be, would be, would be sounded before prayer. We'd say, hey guys, it's time to come together and pray. <laughs> they would sound the trumpet for a place of people to assemble, to begin praise and worship. Some churches I know in town still do that. Sometimes they'll do a song, an opening song, and say, okay, that was the call to worship. Some churches have a, a, of a timer on their screens, and it counts down. It's the same point. It's a call to worship. It's saying, all right, guys, come on. It's time to, 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 to start wrapping up some of the other little conversations or things that we're doing because we're about to come together, and corporately, we're going to do something powerful, and we're going to worship the Lord God Almighty. We're coming together. What was it? It's an example of, of maybe today of how we might use that same, that same principle or idea of sounding the trumpet. It's a sound that would be sounded when there would be an attack united against the enemy. It was a rallying call for the people to come together for a purpose. I don't know about you, but I hear a trumpet sound. And in talking to pastors throughout the West region and throughout our city, churches, the pastors were hearing the place of the trumpet sound. We always want to think about the trumpet that's going to sound at the end where we'll get caught up in the glorious, you know. <laughs> Praise God, the trumpet sounds. We're all gathered to meet him in the air. But you know what? There's a trumpet that's sounding that's saying, hey, 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 whoa. What about Hebrews chapter 10? What about my people coming together even more so as we see the day approaching? There's a trumpet sounding in the body of Christ today saying, people, it's time for us not to just focus on living our individual lives, but to come together, partner with one another, pray with one another, believe with one another, and do what they did right here, which was just to stand Stand with one another. And as they stood with one another, allowing their light to shine, the enemy went to flight. Leviticus 26, 8, another great scripture for synergy. It says, five shall chase a hundred. A hundred shall chase 10,000. I'm too small and insignificant. Yeah, you know what? You are by yourself. Our significance is increased when we come together. I need brains. Like literally, no. <laughs> no, we're smarter together. We're smart. That's why they have these things called think tanks. Because one guy sitting in a room by himself trying to dream up everything is going to have limitations. But someone else can come in and say an idea that changes and shifts the direction of thought, takes the limits off. We begin to think differently. We begin to, to, to have synergy in thought. And in strategy and ideas and dreams. The trumpet is a call that's calling us to come together and stand to defy the odds of whatever's against an individual, against a body, or against the body of Christ. We must stand together. And then it says they shouted. What did they shout? They shouted, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. You know, in this section of scripture, and I can't find that it says that any of these guys actually had a sword. I'm not saying they didn't. I don't know. I wasn't there. I do know that if I'm going to oppress people and I'm going to keep, I'm going to try to take your weaponry. Amen. If I'm going to keep you suppressed and keep you down so you can't rise up against me, I want to take the sword away from you. 
So I'm thinking that probably somewhere in this, the Midianites and Amalekites have probably taken a few swords amongst the people, whether they had any stashed or not, I don't know. Some right-wing conspiracy people in here. <laughs> There's one in every crowd. So, but, but, yeah. none of mine are stashed, but anyway. <laughs> but here's the point. I'm thinking if you're hiding in, in, a, in a, a, um, a, a mill, fresh and wheat, right, that you're probably not opening up a, a, um, a blacksmith shop with pumes of sm- plumes of smoke going up while you're mass manufacturing swords if you're hiding, afraid that someone's going to catch you. Anyway, we don't know. I don't think they got armed until they went down in the valley, but that's completely my opinion. Here's the point. They said, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. I want you to see this, that when their shout unified the two. It says, the sword of the Lord and the sword of Gideon. What are they saying? That the sword of the Lord is Gideon's sword. That they heard in the dream, they said, oh, the, 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 the sword of Gideon's going to come get us. You know what they just shouted? It's God's sword. It's the Lord God that brings us the victory. It's not by might nor by strength, but by my spirit, says the Lord. That it was God that was going to bring the victory. And they said that your sword and our sword should be the same sword. What sword are you using? Ephesians chapter 6 tells us, it teaches us that place of the sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Lord is what? The the Word of God. The sword is the Word. What words do we speak when we pray? Our opinion? Our desire? Our want to? Our anger? Our frustration? Fix that person, Lord. Just fix them. I got news for you. That might be the heart of the Lord, but that's not the sword of the Lord. What does his word say about your circumstance? What does his word say about us? What does his word say about people? That's what we pray. That's what we speak. Is the Lord's sword your sword? At the FCF, F, oh dear Lord, in this house, <laughs> FCF de Tucson, la palabra, de, maybe I'll just speak in Spanish and I'll do better. <laughs> Here in this house, part of that is, is, is the vision of what God spoke to us. And uh, some of the, 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 the shifts and some of the, the things in the, uh, that we're making as a people to be about resuscitating the lives of others. To be about a place of not just receiving and my growth, but a place of our growth a place where we intentional about lifting up and helping other people grow. Not just a place where we come together for ourselves, but a place of, of healing where we proclaim. A place of transformation. La presencia de Dios, come on. Is, is the transformado vivas. Formada to vivas, yeah. It, transfer, it, it transforms lives, but it will transform your life. La presencia es la diferencia. It makes the difference. The presence of God contending for the place of the supernatural. A place where people can breathe again. Where we come in here and it's like we come up and we get that breath of air and then we're going to go dive back into the waters. To go rescue the lost and come back up for fresh air. In his presence. You know, the Lord told us when we were moved into this location, he said that this location would be not a, not a, a cathedral. 
But he said, I want this house to be a headquarters for my harvest. And I'm thinking with the 20 plus services that are happening at the jail every week, that's insane. I think you guys are nuts. (laughs) That's a lot. Not to mention some of the other places that many of you partner with. And it's just in your heart and going to the gospel rescue mission, going to the, the, uh, um, uh, uh, the rehabilitation center, ministering each and every week, raising up disciples, encouraging people in their faith, bringing people into the kingdom of God. Even taking those things to, to just the, the, the flavor of God when we go to, 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 to work. Our sword is what we say, but it's also how we live. It's how we live out the word of God. You know, the devil doesn't care if you know scripture. He knows a lot of, he knows more scripture than you do. Come on, he's been around a long time. These 300 people wasn't about a place of just mouthing scriptures, memorizing things. But faith was released as they stood and said, yes, we can. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can impact our neighborhoods. Together, we can uh, 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 um, restore our brokenness in relationships. Together, we're going to make a difference. They were outnumbered, and when the whole... And, and uh, even though the odds may be horribly against us, here's what we learn. The victory wasn't won alone. God could have given Gideon the victory by himself, but who would have got the glory? God could have sent him one versus 135,000. I mean, what's the difference? We're talking about God. Great are you, Lord. Well, you believe it or you don't. One versus 135,000. He could have just done something, tornado, done, they're gone. But he didn't. Why? Because the team helps keep God at the center. A team keeps God at the center. The victory wasn't won alone. When we think we're outnumbered, but we're walking with others in a direction we're walking a plan of God, you're never outnumbered. That means we have to take enough time individually and as a people to listen to, seek God's face, and hear his voice for the next steps. Because when we know where we're going, if we'll go with others, nothing can stop you. Nothing can stop us. There's a light in you that will put the enemy to flight. Our job is to sound the alarm. This is where it gets real and where it gets real scary. Because sometimes sounding the alarm means you need to let people know there's an enemy in your life. Sometimes it means to let people know, you know, I don't, I'm just not doing good right now. (laughs) I'm in a bad space. Sometimes it means. Talk, letting people know about uh, 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 situations, circumstances. And I'm not talking to everybody. You don't get on the, the news and start blabbing and whatever. This is why we have relationships, community. It's that place of being real where we open up and say, here's what's going on. We need that in our lives, every single one of us. And then with one sword and unified purpose, we can accomplish whatever mission the Lord has given us, anything that's before us. God's not moved by the odds, even 450 to one. Talk about a long shot. In the most overwhelming situations, we will win if we'll just trust him proclaim and walk in his victory let his light shine and stand together let's stand up